this is as close to my natural voice that you'll ever hear. I, maybe like <laughs> 20 times a year, it'll set back the way that it should. Um, it has to do with a, a goiter that I have in my neck, and it kind of pulls, I guess, somehow the vocal cords and makes them a bit more high-pitched. But anyway, so uh, I think I'm just going to combine everything from the Atlantic City Boxing Hall of Fame. It's not the best video um, or audio. I'm working on that, and uh, that's coming soon. So just uh, some of the action from Atlantic City Boxing Hall of Fame weekend. I, I only went, it, it was Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I only went to the induction ceremony. So, most of what you see is from the ceremony on Sunday. Um, I want to give a shout out to Mark Abrams and also to Angela Crockett for uh, facilitating everything for us to be able to cover. Also, give a shout out to Nikila Taylor and uh, to my man Adrian Mitchell and to Dre Clark. Also, want to give you, uh, you guys a shout out. So, I'm just going to run, I just kind of piece the videos together and just let it run and see how many minutes it goes and post it. But it was a excellent event. Um, the food was delicious, the cake, the cannoli, <laughs> all of that stuff. Um, the artwork, the plaques that they received, um, Don King, Michael Spinks, some... Uh, decedents also, Lou Duva, Lavander Johnson, Arturo Gotti, so on and so forth. So, I uh, really had a good time in Atlantic City on Memorial Day weekend. <laughs> City Boxing Hall of Fame initial class Mike Tyson, Don King, Larry Hazard, among others. Of course, Vander Johnson, Arturo Gotti, those who left long memories with us, even though they're not with this physically. Atlantic City Hall of Fame. The initial induction. Got a nice uh, Jack Johnson exhibit. Here are some of the uh, participants, Dwight Braxton, a.k.a. Dwight Muhammad Kawi, Michael Spinks, Mike Tyson, Arturo Gotti, Don King, Evander Johnson. These are some of the inductees, Larry Hazard. Arturo Gotti certificate. Mike Tyson certificate. Excellent work. The Atlantic City Boxing Hall of Fame. Here's a shot of the venue before the party gets started. Beautiful setup here.
see the red carpet, little boxing gloves on the, the seats. Gentleman in the white uh, representing Jack Johnson. There's uh, Aaron Snow. Most of you remember him from uh, training Mike Tyson at one point. He's got his back turned to us. Arturo got his daughter. Please come up. Okay. Hello. Are you in charge? Oh, I know. Yeah, like I'm finally doing it. Oh, my God. We're going to hurt a guy. Okay. Arrival of Larry Hazard. against Ken Norton to become the heavyweight champion of the world. He defended that title 19 consecutive times, only second to Joe Lewis. He knocked out eight opponents straight in the heavyweight championship matches, and that matched Tommy Burns' all-time record. He had a streak of 48 in a row until someone sitting over there put it to an end. <laughs> <laughs> but he beaten guys like Ali and Shavers. You know his record. Let's hear it for the Eastern Assassin, Larry Holmes. An individual who was also inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame several years ago, Burt. Randolph Sugar! And when the Catholic nuns found him, he couldn't even pronounce his name. And they decided to give him a name. And they named him Matthew. And uh, they had to give him a last name. It was found on the Ben, Park, ben, uh, ben, ben Franklin Parkway. And he gave him the name of Matthew Franklin. And as we know, he became a world champion. He became famous. And uh, he kept a burning desire to find out who he really was. So after he became champion, uh, his story as a great champion uh, became public. And we began to talk about the fact that we didn't know who he was. And long story short, uh, Matthew offered a $10,000 reward for anyone that could um, provide any information to his true identity. Well, long story short, and we can go on, I think there should be movies made about it. But long story short, uh, a woman came forward in Philadelphia. We had an attorney who was able to authenticate uh, her claim, and matter of fact, she said some buzz words that Matthew remembered as a four-year-old, and we actually found out who he was. Uh, by that time, we got national attention. Uh, Good Morning America televised a grand reunion of him meeting of his siblings, and it was just unbelievable. And everyone else knows he adopted the Islamic faith and uh, became uh, 
Matthew Saad Muhammad, uh, but we found out that his real name was Antonio Loach. You know, <laughs> so all of the fighters know what I'm talking about, and the managers. You know, training camps are pretty brutal. You know, you're there for six, eight weeks, and you got to find something to laugh about. So of course, we started calling him Antonio, <laughs> and he hated it. You know, Antonio Loach, and. Um, you know, yeah, it was like an Italian name or something, you know? But anyway, before I continue the story, I, I can't go much further. Matthew was adopted by a Portuguese uh, immigrant, Mr. John and Catherine Santos, and we can't say enough about them. But he was raised in the household with Joe Johnson. Joe, would you stand up? This is Matthew's adopted brother. And he knew Matthew was a kid. He was an older brother. And I can honestly tell you about Joe. Joe uh, was uh, his brother uh, as a kid, uh, prior to boxing, during boxing, and throughout the rest of Matthew's life. He was a friend, a brother, and a confidant. So let's give Joe a round of applause. Um, you know, I've had the good fortune of actually working for two fighters in the world. And we won't talk about the other fighter, but I have to mention his name. But thanks to Matthew Saad Muhammad, after uh, Matthew, well, I left Matthew. I just couldn't, um, and, you know, Mr. Dwight Kwawi is here. And um, after the second Kwawi fight, I personally thought that, you know, Matthew should probably begin to do some other things. And so we separated, but my luck <laughs> got even better. Um, Post-retirement, I was asked to uh, travel with the greatest, Muhammad Ali. And thanks to my relationship with Matthew, I think that Muhammad Ali and Lonnie, uh, they trusted me very much. I traveled the world. I saw things and heard things that I just couldn't dream of as a kid. So I actually worked for two fighters, and people always wonder, well, what does Mustafa do, or who is he? And I really don't have a long history in the fight business except for Matthew Saad Muhammad and Muhammad Ali. But let's get back to Matthew. I can guarantee you, as I look out, I see a lot of happy people here, especially with the inductees and the honorees. I can honestly tell you, and the people that know Matthew, he would have the biggest smile today of everyone in the room. He would be so excited. I mean, he had a thousand watt, megawatt um, uh, uh, smile. And um, he would be the happiest person in the room. I don't want to take up any more time. We've got a lot of greats here, and I've got a million Matthew Saad Muhammad stories. So if anyone wants to approach me at any point, we can talk about it. But I want to be kind to the honorees. I'm going to give up the microphone. Thank you very much. Then. <laughs> um, and Jimmy Carter is running for president of the United States, right? Mr. King and Carter are talking not once, not twice, five, six times a day. And it was incredible. And finally, one day, I'm with Don so often when he was talking to the future president, and he said, he called him Jimmy, by the way. And I think Mr. Carter called him Mr. President. <laughs> But anyway, he turned the phone over to me and I said, Mr. President, what an honor. I said, just so you know, uh, Don King is doing everything. He is really pushing. Jimmy Carter became president of the United States, the headlines of the Cleveland Plain Dealer. His new president got in with a black vote and the Jewish vote. Two days later, there was a major press conference at the Sheridan Hotel. When all, forget the sports. All the city side, the news that came from Columbus, that came from Cincinnati, that came from Toledo, they're all to see Don King because Don was all over the papers when Carter became president. The kicker to this is not only did he take credit for getting the black vote, he took credit for getting the Jewish vote. <laughs> <laughs> One more. Uh, Don and I, it, it was an incredible relationship. And 
We did a show for Black Hospital that was doing on her. He brought Muhammad Ali, who was Cassius Clay then, in the box exhibitions. I became so enamored, I just could not believe about Don, all right? And I sat down with him one day, and this was just right after the event uh, that we held at the Cleveland Arena. And I said, Don, you are going to become the biggest boxer promoter this world has ever seen. And he just looked at me. I said, I'm going to take you to New York. I want to introduce you to Teddy Brenner in Madison Square Garden. I'm going to introduce you to Harry Marston, the president of Madison Square Garden. I'm going to take you to meet the writers from the New York News, New York Post. Um, I think uh, uh, Dick Young. Dick Young was a New York member then, and so forth. I'm 5'7", he's 6 plus, and he looked down at me. He said, Don, what are you talking about? He said, they're all white, and I'm black. I said, they're all white. I was taught an incredible lesson by a fantastic woman. And I took my finger, and I actually put it in his chest. I said, do not ever say that to me again. I said, Don, I'm taking you to New York. This is America. He looked down at me. He says, America? Yeah, maybe only in America. <laughs> That's the thing. Triple G S! <laughs> Triple S sensational Steve Smoker! Ice, what up, Ice? Good to see you. Bless you. I've been in with everybody in this gym. <laughs> Be that as it may, Henry was rather judge, but the judge of the city court. Been a referee my entire life, and I'm thrilled. Um, I think Bill Johnson and I share the honor of being the only, among these fabulous inductees, the only born and bred Atlantic City natives on the, the uh, dais or being inducted this evening. And I'm very proud of that fact. Um, a product of the Atlantic City school system, Atlantic City High School. <laughs> so AC's over here, fabulous. Um, I've had the distinct honor and privilege to work for every one of these gentlemen who are being honored tonight. Mr. King, Mr. Gill, Mr. Peltz, Mr. Duva, Dino Duva. I hope I didn't miss anybody. And speaking of Don Elbaum, I am the pure product of, I'm the child of the Tuesday night at the trial. Mm -hmm. I was there almost every Tuesday throughout the, the tenure of the Tropicana. And it was a, where no one would have the benefit of honing their skill, learning their craft, work makes you better, and 82 to 86, 87, that's where I honed my skill under initially an icon who I'm going to tell these guys better be honored real soon and that's Jersey Joe Walcott. My first boss, the guy that gave me my license in my hand. That's a story unto itself. Bob Lee, I hope members of his family are here. He's being honored this evening. He treated me like gold. He left the commission and became the IBF, and the IBF took care of me, and I had my first title fight overseas. In those days, they wanted to see how you worked out before they put you on American TV. And things worked out well. Bob was pleased, came back, and began my title career. But to be recognized and honored in your own hometown with the people that you work with from time immemorial. This has been a fabulous memory lane weekend for me. My first exam, Frank Doggett. Uh, you know, you, you can't, uh, these memories will always be there. Every face I've seen, last night we had all Atlantic City, some workers that I had been with as city solicitor. Um, I've had a fabulous career. And I pray to God that uh, God allows me to continue. There's a piece of paper that says I am, I think with the retirement of um, Pat Russell in California, I could be oh, the course. most senior Thank working you. official 
if not in America, the world. So as we say at the PAL gym, let the beat go on. God bless you all. We are Tara Gotti's daughter. Nona, Zia, and Zio, and I want to thank Atlantic City and all of his fans for this award for my dad. Thank you. Thank you to everyone here. We greatly appreciate this honor to be inducted to the Atlantic City Boxing Hall of Fame. Thank you to Mr. Chuck Zito for his support throughout all these years of the investigation to find out what truly had happened. I'm humbled to be up here as well with Sophia and Chuck and my wife and my children to accept this award. Thank you all. Atlantic City has been very good to the Gaddies and we appreciate it very much. We're humbled and we're grateful for it all. Thank you. Self Arturo Gotti. <laughs> Accepting the award in Mike Sciarra, Chuck Zito, and Sophia Gotti. One, one in particular. As Henry said, I started when I was 22. This was 1969, and then for the next seven and a half months, we promoted 15 shows at the Blue Horizon. In those days, they didn't have all the medical restrictions, so it was a lot easier. All you needed was a heartbeat, and sometimes not even that. But I turned 23 that December, and my first show in 1970, I featured one of my boyhood heroes by the name of George Benton. You may know George is a terrific trainer, but he was an outstanding fighter. He lost like 13 out of 76 fights. So he fought for me in January of 1970 at the Blue Horizon, and he won. And we made about $300 on the show. We were charging five and three to get in. And I paid George $1,000, which was a lot of money back then. And when the show was over, his manager, who I regard as as good a manager in the history of boxing as I ever knew, a man named Joe Bramby, he came to me and said, when can we fight again for you? I said, Joe, you can fight for me in March. He said, okay. So I went home and I promoted another show two weeks later and I started thinking, do I really want to go through the aggravation of paying George Benton a thousand dollars and a bonus six hundred? when I could buy a whole main event in those days for like eight or nine hundred. But I was so intimidated by Joe Bramby because he'd been around boxing his whole life. Bob Montgomery, Richie Cates, Charlie Scott, Tony Thornton. I didn't know how to back out of it. But I'd go to the gym every night, Champs Gym in North Philly, and as the weeks went on, Benton wasn't coming into the gym. I said, okay, maybe sick, maybe got another fight. Maybe Granby changed his mind, and January turned into February, and now we're, I started calling other fighters, still running every two weeks, and then about, the fight was scheduled for March 25th, like three and a half weeks before the fight, I'm at the top of the steps at the gym, or in all gyms at the top of a long set of steps. And here comes George up with his raggedy old pale yellow suitcase, which he used as his gym bag. The guy where, you know, the flippers on the end, you flip it and they open up. And I said, oh, George, what are you doing here? He said, Russell, aren't I fighting for you in a few weeks? He said, well, I hadn't seen you, George. I hadn't seen you in the gym, so I was making other plans. So there was a payphone right there as soon as you walked into the gym. And those of you who remember payphones. He put a dime or a quarter in and he calls Grammy up. And George had that sandpaper voice force. He hands me the receiver. Granby never called me Russell. He called me promoter, entrepreneur, impresario. He says, promoter. Well, Granby was about 60 at the time. I'm 23. He says, George tells me he may not be using them on March 25th. So I said, Joe, we never signed a contract. And he said to me, I'll never forget it. He said, isn't your word any good? He made me feel this big. I said, forget it, Joe. Forget it. 
fight's on, you're going to fight. So the fight came off, and actually it was the first time I lost money on a show. But I kept my word, and I'm, I'm, I was honored to have promoted George Benton's last two fights in Philadelphia. So I'm going to fast forward now to 1982. By now, Grammy and I are very close, mutual respect. And I was getting ready to participate in a cable TV series with the late Dan Duva, who had gotten together a group of cable systems to televise monthly cards. And Frank Gell got us into resorts. This was April of 1982, and we needed a big name. So Danny called me one day. He said, how about Tex Cobb? I said, OK. Tex Cobb was managed by Joe Grimm. So I called Joe up and we made the deal, paying Tex Cop $20,000 to open this cable series. So I met Joe on a Sunday, I picked him up at his house, and we drove and had breakfast at the famous deli in, in Philadelphia. And he signed the contract for 20 grand for Tex Cop to fight Jeff Shelburne at the resorts. So I, I took him home, I dropped him off at his house, I drove about 25 minutes home. And as soon as I got home, Linda's on the phone, my wife, she says, Joe Grammy just called. Hear it, you know, talk to him. What could this be? Hey, promoter, guess who just called me? I said, I have no idea, Joe. He said, Don King. So my heart sank. <laughs> I said, what's up, Joe? He just offered me half a million dollars for Tex Cobb to fight Larry Holmes in May or June. <laughs> he said, what do you think I told him? I said, I have no idea, Jeff. He said, I told him I can't do it. But I made a deal with you, and I'm not going to back out of it. So I said, I said, what did Don say? He said, you don't want to know what he said. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, you learn things like that. Tex Cobb went through with the fight for us. He got cut early in the fight. He knocked out Jeff Shelberg in the seventh round. And later that year, in November of 1982, he did get his shot at Larry Holmes and lost the 15-round decision. The one that Tex Cobb said he didn't really lose to Larry Holmes. He just lost the first 15 rounds. <laughs> so I'm not up here to tell you that I'm perfect because we all have skeletons in our closet. But through that incident, you learn that if you don't have your word, you have nothing. Thank you. And Don and Arthur were very friendly. So we were doing a press conference up in New York and we're promoting the show, promoting the show, and I come back to Atlantic City the next day. Now remember, I'm the president in the ballets. I'm supposed to be running the casino, 5,000 employees, making sure everything's going well. So at the press conference, Don made a quote and called me the light of the boardwalk. And it showed up on the front page of the New York Times. So I got a call from Mr. Goldberg the next morning and said, are you the boxing president or are you the president of Bally's? And I'll never forget that. And it's the only time I've ever been on the front page of the New York Times, Don. Thank you very much. What elevates some people to victory? How do things unfold? What are the big moments? And if you're in media and boxing, you're going to find plenty of big moments. When the Atlantic City Press decided to make me their boxing writer and we came out here, the pathway to victory was the industry itself. This was a magical time because of a set of factors that you could only dream of. Atlantic City was making its mark alongside Las Vegas and competing with Las Vegas in the casino business and using boxing as the catalyst to do it. So, since we had this great amount of talent looking for a venue, and we had casinos attracting high rollers through boxing, and we had this wonderful staggering that every couple of years a new casino would open, we had this perpetual realm of magic. And Atlantic City was a cavalcade of power brokers, boxers, promoters, managers, network officials, all coming in and out of here to make their mark and make their statement. And it created 
all the wonderful things we had here and made Atlantic City a boxing capital. This was a marketplace of deals and dreams. And not all the dreams took place in the big title fights. The things that warm your heart sometimes covering the sport would be someone like a Ben Serrano, who was here in 1982, and the other half of that Donald King story, Don Elbon. Nobody knew who this guy was when he came in here. He was four and nine. But when he knocked out his opponent, the crowd at the Tropicana erupted. Benny, Benny, Benny. They screamed his name, these people who he had won over. And it really underscores how in boxing, you can be an underdog and walk into a place and you can walk out owning the building. And for Benny Serrano, that was the story of a lifetime. And there are many stories like that when you cover boxing on your way up, which is what it did for me. Then in 1985, when ESPN called and said, can you do a fight for us? Well, I could, and I'm happy to say that 32 years later, I still am. To do it at this level and to go to the places you measure. Is it the 2,500 fights you've called? The 180 cities? Probably not. I think what sticks with you the most is the idea that maybe there are 10, 15 boxing announcers who have the opportunity to do this, as opposed to if you were an NBA announcer or a baseball announcer, there could be 60 jobs in those sports. But in boxing, these jobs are a coveted few, and that's why it is something that is a cherished feeling all the time and that's why for me boxing never ever gets old of course we all know what happened in tokyo he also won the crowns again in the wba and the wbc until he got beat by hollyfield twice and of course lennox lewis he's probably one of the most recognizable individuals in the world today and his name is Iron Mike Tyson. Hi, it's Nikhila reporting live from the Fight Journal. I have the opportunity to be with Mr. Michael Stinks. How are you this evening? I'm doing pretty good. Well, first of all, congratulations for being inducted to the Hall of Fame tomorrow. Are you excited? All right. Yeah, kind of, kind of. Kind of? <laughs> kind of? You're kind of excited. I mean, kind of excited to where, uh, you know... I, I've been smiling all day, so. Oh, you more a little I, I think bit more I'm really excited. <laughs> okay, all right. So when did you arrive in town? I, I when was that? Yesterday. Yesterday. Okay, all right. So one of the viewers had a question they wanted told me to ask. So don't laugh. All right. So they said that they found out and heard that a lot of celebrities have moved to Delaware. Their question is, are the homes in Delaware tax free? Uh. I think it's tax free shopping. Okay. No, you, you, uh, I think you, you uh, it, there's a tax, there's a school tax, and there's some, some other kind of tax that I can't think of. <laughs> but I pay it every year. Okay. You uh, said I pay it every year? <laughs> yeah, I pay it every year. I can't remember. <laughs> but you got school tax, and you got, um, I just, I guess, uh, I don't know what you would call this tax, but. <laughs> Okay. But it's tax-free shopping. Tax-free shopping, okay. You shop all day long and not pay no taxes. Okay. All right, so the next question is, we haven't seen you make a lot of public appearances. Is that norm for you, or um, have you just been quiet? Are you working on something, or? Well, um, I, 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 have, I have made a number of, of, of appearances. Okay. But I, I, I guess I'm just not making them in the right place. Okay. But what I do, I do, I do be called to make a presence. And I, I, I've done it a lot uh, while my career was going on, and even, and even after my career. Okay, yeah. okay. So the next question is, um, is there anything that you would have done differently with your career as a boxer? No, I, 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 wouldn't, say, I wouldn't say I would. I, uh, I, I had, I, had a, I, I was a blessed young man because mm -hmm. I had I uh, fractured my big toe and it resulted in a, a weak, weak joints in my knee on up to my hip on up to my hand to my top of my head 
and I managed to get back in the ring and uh, uh, overcome some of those uh, things that happened. I, I fractured my toe and went, go, and went and go see a doctor. But I'm, think, I'm thinking this is going to go away, you know, some crazy thing. I don't know where I got that from. I'm thinking it's going to go away, but it, it results in, you know, in weak muscles in my, on my entire left side, the right side. So, But I kept working. I kept working. And I, you know, I got back in the ring and I was able to use my limbs uh, very well. But I became, a, it, it altered my style to where I, you know, I used my, I used my left hand so much. And I was, I was hooking off the jab too. I jab with that jab and, and hook off the jab at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, my, my boxing style became untouchable. Couldn't nobody touch me. You know, I get with a jab every now and again. Maybe a, 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 a measly right hand, but I became untouchable. I, I developed a style that was untouchable, and uh, you got. Th I thank God for that one. Because right. not getting hit is that's a blessing. <laughs> well, you're not getting hit in a fight. So, and I managed. I managed to uh, develop a style of untouchable boxing. So that that was you can't you can't beat that. You can't beat that. So. That was a blessing. All right, and my last question is, so what is Mr. Spinks doing at this time? Doing at this time, I, I do pretty much what I want. Okay. I do anything I want. You know, I, I, I try to, uh, you know, keep working. I mean, I, I, I see that I got to work out. I got to continue to work out because you get, you get kinks and, uh, you know, you get out of shape. So I, I thought I'd pick it back up, but I thought I would have to work out for the rest of my life because... I thought once you stop, you know, from from doing it, you, I mean, you've been doing it most of your young life, and then you just quit doing it. I, th I thought that would that would be a, a slow a slow death in, in, in one way or another. But uh, but I like working out, and it, and, it, and, it, and working out did a whole lot did a lot for me in, 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 in my uh, younger years, and so I I just got to keep it up, and I like it. It's, it's good it's good for me. This does a lot for my mental state, and it's it's a, it's a lot of fun. It hurts sometimes, but, but getting started, you, you get a little pain, but uh, you overcome that, and then you begin. All right, so you're just enjoying life now. Just enjoying life. That's a beautiful thing. Thinking better. <laughs> Thinking All right. better, acting better, and it's, it's a blessing. All right, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. But All right, once again, then. congratulations. Okay. It's Michael Spinks. He went on to beat Holmes again. And he also knocked out Jerry Cooney. And of course, uh, we won't dude, talk about the Mike Tyson fight. But let's hear it for our next inductee in the International Boxing Hall of Famer himself, Michael Spinks. <laughs> and I have to tell you, Michael is one of the nicest individuals I've ever met in the boxing field. He's a real class act. We had a lot of, uh, we did a lot of boxing at Joe Frazier's gym. 
uh, nearly every day. You know, and then I even took him on the road with me a couple of times to uh, help me get ready for a fight because he was a hard guy. I mean, punch, punch hard, you know, and, um, you know, but I was able to tame him a little bit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I'd like to thank the uh, Atlantic City Boxing Hall of Fame for, uh, you know, bestowing his honor on me, and I appreciate it, and I'd like to thank you all for showing up, and, uh, you know, to be a witness to what they do. So, anyway, thanks a lot. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much, Henry. Before I begin... Let me thank Mr. Ray McCline, Mr. Roger Green, and my dear friend, Mr. Roy Foreman, for having this great vision. Because boxing is alive, and it will be alive here in Atlantic City for many, many years to come. Next, if you will allow me, I would certainly like to uh, thank my wife, Patricia, and my family. Because... support that they've given me. You know, I, I came uh, uh, in 1978, uh, Jersey Joe Walcott was the commissioner of boxing in the state of New Jersey. And his uh, deputy commissioner, Bob Lee, Robert W. Lee, Bob Lee, and his very able assistant, Marion Muhammad, they brought me here to Atlantic City. They, I was recruited out of the amateur ranks in boxing as a referee in the state of New Jersey. And in 1978, I had toiled in the vineyards of the amateurs for 11 years. Bob Lee recruited me. He brought me here to Atlantic City and gave me the opportunity to exercise my skills and abilities as a professional boxing referee. During those years, of course, my, my, my children were all uh, toddlers, and um, my wife had realized that when she married me, she also married the sport of boxing. And so she deserves a lot of credit for that, because I spent a lot of time away from home. I was in Atlantic City, uh, weekly, uh, refereeing fights, great series of bouts that uh, Don Elbaum, Presented at the Tropicana, Tuesday night, Tuesday night, Thursday night, there was a Thursday night series. Uh, some weeks uh, I could be seen on um, USA television. Then on Saturday, you would see Larry Hazard again, CBS Sports Channel 2, and then Sunday afternoon, Wide World of Sports Channel 7. So I was getting a great deal of uh, visibility uh, as, as a boxing referee. And for that, I am, I am eternally grateful. Um, several years later, uh, Bob Lee, he created the International Boxing Federation, the IBF. And then he took me around the world to referee world championship fights all over the globe. And, and, and I made quite a name for myself. And, he, 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 and Bob used to say to me, he said, Larry, when you're in the ring as a third man, you make me feel very comfortable. And, and those words always served during my career as a referee as great words of inspiration for me to be the best that I could be. And I strived very hard to do that. I was committed to the sport of boxing. Um, I was an educator at the same time, and I shared my passion for both, working with young people, working with fighters, and I tried to always be a positive role model. And I never uh, uh, thought about uh, my longevity as a, a referee as being the measurement for my greatness, but it was in my integrity was the important thing for me. And I always uh, made it my business to make the health and safety of the fighters first. 
So I would stop fights when I felt that a fighter was taking too much punishment because I always felt that it was better to stop one a little bit too early than to stop one too late. So that was my mantra, and I carried that for many years. And so God has blessed me in many ways because I have had the unique opportunity to be associated with all of these great men who are being honored here today, along with me. Don Elbaum, don't get me started about talking about uh, some of his stories. Don Elbaum taught me the art of matchmaking. Uh, Dave Bon Temple, I knew I would uh, have to endure his wrath the day after a fight if the quality of fights that were being presented in Atlantic City were not top quality. Russell Peltz, who is still very active as a matchmaker, and a man who I've always considered to be one of the top matchmakers in the world, if not the top. Frank Gell, a great man who Frank and I became very close. Frank put on boxing matches here in Atlantic City that surpassed all others. And remember that office you had, Frank, on the 13th floor in resorts. I would go by there and talk with Frank and Rose Patterson. Ken Condon, who he became our Donald Trump after Donald Trump kind of left because Donald Trump really made boxing in Atlantic City what it became. And of course, while we is gone, but I was either the referee in one of the high profile major fights in Atlantic City, or I presided over the fight as the commissioner for the last 39 years. I was the referee when Muhammad Kwawi and Michael Spinks fought at the convention center. And yes, Michael, that was a knockdown. <laughs> okay. I was the commissioner. In the battle of the two Michaels, Michael Spinks and Mike Tyson. So I have really been blessed in the sport of boxing. I have a great passion for the sport. My wife, she says that I know nothing else. <laughs> so I can't argue with it. But this is such a great tribute. And for it, I am forever grateful. In 2010, I was inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame. That's the Cooperstown of boxing. And I thought at that time that that would be the crowning jewel of my career. But I have to go back and rethink it. Because this is something that is equal to that in my heart. And I, and I truly mean that. So, in closing, in closing, of the state of New Jersey. And in 2007, for those of you who don't know, I had a short respite from the commission. But I also want to thank our present governor, Chris Christie, who brought me back because he knew of my passion and he thought I was good for the sport. So for that, I'm grateful to him. So to all of you gentlemen and to all of you, Thank you very much for making the sport of boxing what it is and what it has been so many years here in the state of New Jersey. And you have been my rock. And you have always been those who I have felt myself to be accountable to. And I will continue to do that. So thank all of you for supporting this great institution. Thank you for listening, and may God bless you. The world's greatest promoter. And if you don't believe it, you can ask him, and you can also go back into a date of December 13th, 2003, when he promoted about here in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Get this eight world title fights. 
He was inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame, and now he's being inducted into the Atlantic City Boxing Hall of Fame, the one and only Don King. <laughs> only in America. Here and I was sitting with Ken Cotton, and he's talking about Arthur Goldberg, who was a very dear friend. And the young lady that just left, she had to catch a bus, uh, Carol Shabazz. Uh, Arthur and I were giving away turkeys at her place here in New Jersey, and it was just a thrill. That was one of the great highlights to do that, you know, have no fear, Arthur Goldberg is here. You know? <laughs> so I'm just delighted. But let me say this I'm a promoter of the people, by the people, and for the people. And my magic lies in my people's eyes. It is you. That really makes me, you know what I mean, the people. And that's what I try to teach and let them know, have confidence in yourself. And that self-confidence is bravery in itself because then you believe in yourself and don't let nobody else tell you what you should have, could have, would have been. You know what I mean? Be what you want to be. And to be able to look in that mirror and love what you see rather than look at it with disdain, contempt, or feeling that you have been disparaged or something. So, you know, the people here have done really wonderful. I'm very grateful to... Uh, Ray McCline and the whole group of all the guys that are here that form this thing here. And Roy is like a son, you know, his big brother George was the one that gave me an opportunity to put the rumble in the jungle on in, the, in, the, in Zaire, you know, so with, uh, with Muhammad Ali. And so Muhammad Ali, I started at the top and I just never left. You know, I, mean? <laughs> I have no boxing career, no promotion, no the other undergraduates at all. I started with Muhammad Ali, you know what I mean? So, and he taught me and we worked together because he stood up for the people. And that's what I tried to do, you know, to emulate and imitate standing up for you, the people, and fight. I picked every president from Jimmy Carter to now, you know what I mean? And so the people that I feel that will come out and work for the people or to bring out all of the daily secrecies that they won't speak about, you know, and be close to your good old boy, Covenants where they have, you know, behind the rug, under the rug, whatever, but don't never tell we the people what the really the truth is. What you have to say about Donald Trump, he is really bringing it all out. Whether like him or dislike him, forget about Trump as an individual. Think about what he's doing for you, enlightening you into what is going on in our great country called America. And that's what counts. They come out, you'll never know people have the different ideas. They bet him like, you know, five times harder than anyone else, but it brings the truth to the fore. So investigation, 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 and that gives you an opportunity to find out what the real deal is on how things are going. So I just want to thank each and every one of you all for coming out here, and I love all of you. And stand up and fight for your rights. It's the greatest country in the world, but you have to make it work, you know what I mean? So this is an opportunity for each and every one of us to learn, to earn, to be able to educate yourself, and to be able to have some confidence in yourself, and go out and fight for your country, not your party. I'm a Republican, I'm not a Democrat, nor a Republican. I'm for the best who will help America and make America strong and make America right. Only in America. God bless you all and thank you very much.